Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just concluded our series on Esther by talking about the perils of pride. And so pride, really, from the first week, we see it in the first session in King's Artsies, and then we see it again in his right-hand man, Haman. Um, And so we talked again about the dangers of pride, um, and so there were quite a few questions that came in. Um, a couple of people asked this question, and I think it's good um, a good question to understand. So as a believer, as a Christian, where does being proud cross over into pridefulness? So sure. what's the difference between being prideful mm-hmm. and being proud? proud? Right. Well, it's a fine line. So I don't know who the questioner was, but let's suppose uh, they have some children. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we parents say, I'm so proud of you, um, which I think is a very important thing to say to our children because they do need encouragement and, and, and because you genuinely are feeling that. I didn't think that's where the problem is. I think the problem, clearly you start to cross the line when uh, now my esteem and my identity is hinging on their achievements or their accomplishments. And now I'm going to you Mm -hmm. and saying, let me tell you about my child. Okay, now this has turned into something that has clearly got some some sin Mm -hmm. on it. Uh, So I don't know, maybe that can be helpful I think there is probably a good deal of subjectivity. Sometimes a question like this, we 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 just want it kind of nice and mm-hmm. black and white. Put it in a box. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we can. Mm-hmm. Some of these things are kind of oozy. You know, that's interesting that you talked about how pride can show up in superiority or inferiority. inferiority. So I would imagine the same. Like sure. if you're hurt because your child's not performing well, yeah, right, and in the reverse. There's some sense of pride. Sure. That and if you, you just need to keep going on and on and on, these people are doing my child wrong. Okay, maybe you, your kiddo got a bad break, but is that what you're going to build your identity mm-hmm. on? Right. From from now till kingdom comes, mm-hmm. uh, or might we move on? Um, because this is not good for your soul. If if it's if you're finding yourself in that place. Good point. That's good. Um, so Matthew 23, 12 says that he who exalts himself will be humbled, mm-hmm. but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Hmm. Your message focused on the former, which the prideful being brought right. low. Wow. Can you speak to the latter, what it means that the humble will be exalted? Sure. Well, when it says the humble will be exalted, that means the humble will be exalted. So let's make it concrete. What would be an example of that? Well, certainly there's no finer example than Jesus. Mm -hmm. We learn in Philippians 2 um, about how this humble Savior came into the world, uh, leaving behind the privileges that he had of um, being God, taking on the form of a man, becoming flesh and blood like you and me, becoming one of us, he can relate to us, having a a life here on earth, being tempted. And so he models this humility, he serves and everything like we were talking about in the message and goes to the cross. Does it get any lower than that? No, but then what does Mm -hmm. God do? Raises him to life and he's our savior and the king and, and, and so. So there's an example, but you can find examples really all the way through. I, let's go back to uh, Joseph. Now, his father tried to exalt him, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a little prematurely. Oh, yeah, and that didn't probably help things because he probably was a little proud about that. And favoritism is never a good thing in a family dynamic. And so he gets sold off in slavery and he goes down. And well, he was getting humbled, 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 mm-hmm. humbled, humbled. And 
Now he's in the dungeon prison wondering, am I going to spend the rest of my life there? Well, one thing or another, God exalts him. Uh, prior to that, I think of Moses, mm -hmm. who had grown up the prince of Egypt, and he had it so great, and then he kills that guy and runs off in the backside of the desert and spends 40 years. And he thinks my life is over, and I'm never going to do any other significant things. And then God shows up in the burning bush and says, you're going to lead my people. You know, and so uh, you can look at King David, who was tending sheep. And then God says, no, you're going to be my king. Mm -hmm. That guy is going to be the king? Just little old shepherd boy David, you know. And um, So you can go through the scriptures, and you can find all of these instances. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all these people that were that went low, but then God would raise them up. Uh, certainly, you move into New Testament times, and and you see the disciples. Several of them came from maybe some privilege or at least some wealth. The tax collectors, in particular, but you get the fishermen. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't get much lower than that. Now they're going to be in the inner circle, and we're going to still talk about those fishermen two thousand years later in church and these sorts. Of, but even they, when they got with each other, what started sneaking in? Pride. Which one of us? Do you like a little bit more than the others, Jesus? Which one's going to sit on your right hand? And, you know, and so he even there had to deal with the disciples um, uh, about that. In more modern times, I mean, I think of Mother Teresa. Well, there's a lady who, who went after the lowest of the low and the poor and the sick in India and just gave her life to, I don't, I don't think she had any PR agents that companies that were going around telling you know getting the spotlight on her but the world did mm -hmm. find her That's and the spotlight did find her um, I think of Corey Tim Boom who was off in the concentration camp why because she tried to protect some Jewish people during uh, the days of Hitler um, from from being extinguished and um, so she ends up in the concentration camp. Her, her family, some of her family dies died, in yeah, the com yeah. concentration mm -hmm. camp. But, but then she comes out and has a story to tell, and she speaks around the world and became quite a famous person and, and was, you know, lifted up. Now she's in, in glory. Um, but even she was asked that question, what do you do, Corey, now that you've got this great story and you speak to stadiums full of people? And she said, well... Every compliment I get, I think of as a rose. And I put all my roses in a bouquet every night, and then I present them to the Lord, hmm. which is a good word. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think um, there's some examples. I think the, the objective for us is probably to set our sights on how can I put on the overalls of humility, mm -hmm. the clothing of humility Peter talked about. How can, well, what's that mean? That means it's a, who could I go after and serve? Um, not so that I'll be exalted, but just because that is what Christ did. I'll just give my life to serving. And maybe I'll never be exalted this side of heaven. Maybe no cameras will ever find me. Nobody will ever know my story. That's okay. God will. And he will exalt uh, in his good time. So I'm going to go after what he's called us to, to go after. That's good. And it's interesting that you brought up about um, the roses. Hmm. Because the next question I have says, so as believers, are we supposed to walk through life never being acknowledged for the good things we do or accomplish? Yeah, well, I wouldn't... Uh, the question's asked in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the answer, I mean, one of the spiritual gifts, it, when you come to the four lists of, of spiritual gifts um, in Corinthians and Peter and Ephesians, is that gift of exhortation or encouragement. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, the, the giftedness of the body of Christ, the, some of the Christians are just really good encouragers. Mm -hmm. And that's really what they're good at, is just giving you attaboys and, and making you feel like I can do this. To encourage means to breathe courage, to encourage life into another person. So obviously, it's not a sin for encouragement to be given. In fact, it's a gift that he has put within Christians to give to one another. I think, though, the, the, the danger comes 
if we get out our Easter basket and start going from person to person saying, put some in my basket, please, uh, now, tell me wh how great I am, tell me what good things I've done and, and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that is now maybe turning into that, that, that pride mm -hmm. thing. Maybe superiority, maybe it's inferiority. It can take either of those ways. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, so this was our final message in the series yeah. on Esther. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few more chapters left in the book. Yeah, right. So can you talk a little bit about how the story ends and the significance of the events that come after? Sure, yeah, it, it, which is an interesting read. It's a little gory, uh, as lots of things were in Old Testament times. Um, so after... Uh, the scene that we talked about today, King Xerxes needs a new chief of staff. Obviously, Haman is gone. And so he says to his queen, Esther, well, why don't you lead the search team to find us the new chief of staff? Well, who do you imagine? Uh, she finds uh, none other than Mordecai. And so she reminds the king, now, you know, you did stamp this edict with your royal ring, um, this edict to kill all the Jews. Now, you didn't know what in the world you were signing on to because Haman had masterminded that. But the law of the Medes and the Persians is an irrevocable law. And so that law still stands in effect. And on this date, it's going to be bad still for us. And he says, well, then in that case, Mordecai, I want you to write a new law that will essentially supersede that law. And here's my ring. And you can stamp that one and set that in place. And <clears throat> so you can read uh, on your own uh, what happened. But it was a clever thing that Mordecai uh, did. And the Jewish people ultimately are saved um, and we're told that because of the events that unfolded, um, people even of other nationalities would come to convert into faith and trust in the one true God. So even roundaboutly, um, evangelism happens because of ultimately this beautiful young lady, Esther, who would become the queen of Persia. It's such a fascinating it story. Is. It and really it's, is. It is. And to see God's hand mm -hmm. all the way through it, even when probably in the moment it didn't feel like, God, where are you? Right. And I can look back and see his hand through orchestrating yeah. all the which, events. Yeah, which is one mm -hmm. of the things scholars point out. You, you don't see God written mm -hmm. in the book, but the author was, was clearly showing, oh, he's very much at work which gives us a hint that he was writing uh, aware of the anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so he was uh, telling the story in a way that the believer could see, oh my gosh, only God. And yet he never mentioned God, but you can't miss him. Such a great story. Yeah. It was such a great series. Thank you yeah. for that. And thank Good. you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.